afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Pat McCormick, president of the City Club, and I'd like to welcome members and guests alike, those of you who join us today at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB radio or watching on Portland Community Media's CityNet 30. Today we will discuss the state of urban development in Portland with John Russell and Brian Libby. But first, some announcements. The generous support of City Club's corporate and media sponsors ensures that we can put on the best civic programs week after week. I'd like to thank our media partners, including Oregon Business Magazine, and our Friday Forum's winter corporate sponsors, the Bank of the Cascades, CenturyLink, Miller Nash, Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield, and The Standard. We're grateful for your support and commitment to the City Club's mission. Please join me in a warm round of applause for our sponsors. <laughs> City Club is launching a ballot measure study committee on the water fluoridation measure coming before voters later this spring. If you'd like to be part of this ballot measure study, apply now. Applications are due January 18th and are available online and on the table near the registration area. Membership in City Club matters. It connects you to your city and fellow citizens, gives you a voice in public policy, and offers you both serious and fun ways to learn about critical issues facing our community. As part of our membership drive launching this month, new members can save $25 on their membership, and every new member and members who refer new members will be entered into a drawing to have lunch with City Club members that include Earl Blumenauer, Ellen Rosenblum, Steve Novick, Dan Saltzman, and others. Membership information is available online and on the membership table at the back of the room. Next week, we are pleased to welcome Senator Ron Wyden as he speaks to us on advancing U.S. energy. You can learn more about future City Club events on our website, uh, pdxcityclub.org. And now our program. Portland gets a lot of attention for our strategic and efficient land use planning, and we're known as one of the greenest and most livable cities in the world. John Russell believes that planning in Portland has evolved from problem solving to defining aspirations. As a result, contentious tough issues that stand in the way of progress aren't being resolved. Brian Libby will moderate this program while John shares his ideas to keep development moving forward in Portland. John Russell is the founder of Russell Development Company and has been actively involved in shaping Portland's skyline for over 30 years. As a volunteer member of the Portland Planning Commission, Portland Historic Landmark Commission, and chair of the Portland Development Commission and the Mayor's Business Roundtable. He has developed some of the most prestigious buildings in downtown Portland, one of which was the first legacy office building in America to receive a gold rating from the U.S. Green Building Council's Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design Program. Brian Libby has spent the past 15 years as a Portland-based journalist and author covering arts, culture, and sports. He has written for Willamette Week, The Oregonian, Portland Monthly, and architecture and design magazines like Architectural Record, Dwell, and Metropolis. In 2009, Brian co-founded the advocacy group Friends of Memorial Coliseum, devoted to saving Portland's landmark 1960 arena after it was threatened with demolition. His blog, Portland Architecture, is one of the city's premier online publications devoted to local design, architecture, and planning. And without further ado, please help me welcome John Russell and Brian Libby. Thanks very much. Thank you everybody for coming today and uh, uh, thanks to the City Club for this opportunity and to all the listeners t on OPB who are taking the time to uh, spend the hour with us. And uh, obviously, John, thanks to you for coming and uh, having this discussion here. So uh, uh, I tried to think of a, a way to sort of dive into the conversation and uh, I thought about 
uh, the breadth of experience you have and that you've really had a unique opportunity to, to view Portland in a variety of different ways over the years, that, that you've seen progress made over the decades, um, starting with the Neil Goldschmidt era that really kind of transformed downtown Portland, and you've also had the chance to uh, occupy a variety of roles in both the public and the private sector. You've been the chair of PDC, the Portland Develop Com De Development Commission, and, and so many committees uh, that I can't even name them all. Uh, yet you've also left a real mark on the city uh, uh, as a private developer as well. And we could talk about big office towers like the PacWest Center, or we could talk about some of the buildings along the waterfront from the cast iron era, uh, one of the greatest eras of architecture that the city participated in. And uh, you even uh, are the developer or the redeveloper of the oldest building in the city along the downtown waterfront. So having said all that, um, uh, as a kind of opening question for you, I wondered if you could take us back for a moment to uh, the 1970s when, when Portland was, was truly transformed. Uh, uh, there was a time, I think people maybe forget or some of our younger listeners might not quite grasp um, how much Portland um, prior to maybe the 1970s was on a, a route to being just kind of like so many other West Coast cities um, um, sprawling out at its edges and so forth. And um, uh, even though uh, history has shown uh, some reasons to believe that maybe Mayor Goldschmidt you know, wasn't always a saint, at the same time he presided over and you were witness to a really kind of special moment in the transformation of the city when we uh, embarked on a journey that's taken us to becoming much more pedestrian friendly, much more compact, uh, much more green, one that emphasizes the pedestrian and mass transit. So having said all that, um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that time in the 70s um, and what was, what's, what was made it special or, or if there are any particularly instructive things to know as we try and make sense of a whole host of issues today. Well, I think, I think there are two fundamental differences between what happened then and what's happening now what happened then uh, was an emphasis, if you will, on the, on the physical world. And it was true in Portland, it was true in Salem. Um, in Salem, we had a governor who was concerned that the Willamette Valley would be sprawled. And that resulted in, in the passage of Senate Bill 100. But it was an emphasis on, on the physical world. And in Portland, the same thing was true under Mayor Goldschmidt. But there was a conviction then that the city was dying, uh, and I think for valid reasons. And so we needed, in the opinion of the majority, a vast change in the physical world, uh, whether it was the construction of two parking garages, the demolition of a two-story garage for Pioneer Place, uh, Pioneer Square, um, lots of changes, the beginning of light rail. So. Anyway, an emphasis on the physical world, and nowadays, or in, in recent times, I think, planning has come to be um, an emphasis on sort of the context of what we do, more of a, a soft idea of planning, not, not the physical world. Right. And I think the second thing that's different is that back then, the mayor asked the planning commission with some trepidation to deal with tough issues, really tough issues, contentious issues, knowing for a while that those issues would eventually come to council. So the mayor asked for trouble. And uh, I think in recent years, in the past decade, the mayor hasn't challenged the planning commission to come back with really tough issues and instead um, has done more ethereal planning. And it, this will put people's teeth on edge, but I, I'll go ahead. I think you can make a comparison to the change in the word kumbaya. <laughs> when I was a dope-smoking, motorcycle-riding graduate student, kumbaya was a positive term, you know? <laughs> and it was, yes, it was coming together, but it was coming together to protest the war. And uh, kumbaya now is, has, a, has a pejorative connotation. It's dithering. It's dealing with stuff that's unarguable. It's a waste of time. And I think to some degree, planning in the last decade has been kumbaya planning. Right, right. Uh, I understand. So people that. will stop doing their emails now and pay attention. <laughs> 
And I understand from our prior conversations that uh, you believe, uh, particularly that the planning and development parts of the city haven't necessarily been functioning as well as they can. And so, is that really correct? Uh, you know, what's the how and why there? Well, I think it, it, it have to, you'd have to ask the question, if, you're, if you disagree with the, what's happening, are you out of touch or are they out of touch? And um, I guess that's an open question. <laughs> How might you be out of touch then? Well, I th there's the, 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 the Portland plan, which was just finished uh, less than a year ago, um, concluded things that I think are unarguable. We need to do something about the graduation rate. We need a healthy, happy city. We need a city that's prosperous. We need to do everything in the context of equity. Unarguable things, it took several million dollars in three years to arrive at that conclusion. And as a result, there wasn't the staff effort put into the really contentious issues. Right, right. It, uh, a lot of these, as you've said, sound like good values, but maybe what you're saying then is that they don't necessarily constitute uh, urban planning in the traditional sense. No, they don't. They don't. They don't deal with the physical world. And we've had two mayors in a row who, although have got, uh, although we can attribute lots of different accomplishments to them, both Tom Potter and Sam Adams uh, made, uh, whether you call it visioning or planning, a, a central part of their administration. Yes, that's right. Tom. Tom had a. Uh, Tom is the world's most decent human being. Uh, but his, his vision PDX, I think, was roundly criticized as a waste of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then Sam Adams embarked on the Portland plan uh, that tried to arrive, and it's hard to argue with it, it tried to arrive at a context of how you make decisions. But it didn't make decisions. It, it arrived at the context of how you would make them. So we have kind of a laundry list of, of particular projects and issues that we're going to delve into. But uh, before we do that, um, before we get to the issues that you believe matter in that regard, uh, how do you think we've come to, to where we are today? Well, it's a, it's a question that I've given a lot of thought to and I've talked to a ton of people about. And um, I think it, 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 it's based on the fact that 30 or 40 years ago, change was in the air. If you were not a politician that was bold, you were ignored. And uh, the status quo was unacceptable, the status quo was dangerous. And I don't think there's that same conviction now. And uh, if, if there isn't an appetite for change, the truth is you don't need the Planning Commission. You don't even need the Development Commission. So I think there isn't the sense of crisis about the, the, the sense of need for change. Absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, there's kind of an irony I, irony, I suppose, to the timing of this conversation in that uh, we're sitting here talking about a lot of things that Portland could or should, should do differently, but um, these are really salad days uh, in some respects for the city of Portland, at least if you measure it in a kind of pop cultural way. We've got a, a, a sitcom, Portlandia, about the show. Everybody's always making reference to how many times the New York Times is covering us and so forth. So, um, you know, in some ways things could not be better, but uh, uh, but though, or you know, you could think about things like food carts, for example, uh, uh, any number of cultural factors. But but that's still something different from uh, you know what uh, what constitutes uh, on the ground urban planning. Yes, and I th and I, th I mean there are issues that I care deeply about that aren't getting resolved that I think stand in the way of Portland progress. Right, right. We talked earlier about uh, Neil Goldschmidt and, and his imprint on the city, but uh, you uh, have also talked about how much uh, Tom McCall was an important leader for the city, but that maybe he would be unelectable today. Yeah, I think, uh, well, a friend of mine, Dave Yaden, has this theory that politics, small p, exists in a wide band that changes slowly but dramatically over time. And uh, if you can imagine a thousand Republicans signing up for the primary for governor, if Tom McCall were among them, he'd finish dead last. And yet we revere him as one of Oregon's greatest governors. So time, you know, times are just different. That's, that's, just, that's just the case. Yeah, 
And that probably seems to speak to uh, a larger dichotomy that exists far beyond the borders of Portland uh, in our elections at all levels, federal, state, and local. We seem to lack this kind of uh, middle ground where the, the belief in the nobility of the, of the middle ground, uh, um, and, and that maybe is what helps to elect leaders like a, a liberal Republican such as, as Tom McCall or maybe a conservative Democrat who wants to reel in, reel in a runaway budget. But, but there are bright spots. I mean, the mayor of New York, a Republican, has uh, refused to let his citizens be supersized. <laughs> and the governor of New Jersey was openly critical, really critical of the Democratic uh, leaders in Congress. So, and he's a Republican. So there's, there are rays of hope for sure. Right, right. So maybe this would be a good time to, to dive into some of those projects that we've been referring to, and especially given the fact that um, tackling individual projects is really so much of what I think this conversation is, we've imagined it is about, either not so much even uh, that we should do this or that with a project, but that maybe that sometimes we need to fish or cut bait a little bit more than we do. Yeah, get, a, get on with it, that's right. Right, right. So, um, you know, just looking at one example for exa uh, uh, on my list, I, I have the Superfund site on the North Reach of the Willamette, for example. It's maybe not something that gets a lot of press, but it's a, a major factor in the economic viability of the city going forward. Well, I think it should get a lot of press. It's a huge area. It's a very important industrial area within the bounds of the urban growth boundary. It's been tied up in contentious issues for almost as long as I can remember, certainly 20 years. But uh, clearly the Planning Commission can't trump EPA. But I th would love to see a Planning Commission hearing about the, about the North Reach where all the parties that, that are the warring parties on this are actually heard, they hear each other, and I just can't believe that that mo wouldn't move the ball down the field. Uh, not. It's to say the Planning Commission couldn't reach a decision, but it's so important and it's lagged for so long with seemingly uh, no end to sight. The super fund, by the way, is a super non-fund. <laughs> the funding for that was a tax on the chemical industry, which long since disappeared. Perhaps there's no uh, place in the entire city that seems to have as much potential, but also um, as much room for debate as the central east side of the city. Uh, uh, it's right across from downtown, and today, as has been the case for many decades, it's an industrial sanctuary. And uh, um, there are a lot of things that, that could really change in that district. Uh, we could be uh, allowing zoning for mixed use and residential uh, projects. We could um, remove the east bank of the I-5 freeway. Um, we could um, bury the railroad. Uh, but those are a lot of um, big ticket items and, and would be some pretty fundamental change. And at the same time, we have seen over the past few decades that the Central East Side has, um, maybe in part because of the presence of the I-5 East Bank Freeway, um, been allowed to sort of progress at, a, at a, a slower rate. And as a result, there's really kind of something wonderful happening there in that uh, it's still officially an industrial district, but uh, when you go there, it's really become a mix of industrial businesses and this burgeoning creative class. So having said all that, um, uh, what do you think about both the potential uh, and the challenges of the Central East Side? Let me count the challenges in the Central East Side. Uh, it's got Interstate 5 on the surface that separates the Central East Side from the river. It's been studied to death. Uh, my good friend Greg Baldwin uh, had a study that depressed it in, in, in a cut and cover. Uh, th this is the interstate, the I-5. Uh, having said it's been studied to death, it's not vetted. It's, the, the decision hasn't been made about what should be done with it. Granted that there's no money for it, but it's very important that the decision be made about what should happen so that things don't happen around it that would preclude that. Uh, secondly, you've got the main line of Amtrak and Union Pacific running right through the Central East Side on the surface. Uh, Kitty Piercy, the mayor of Eugene, and I co-chair the state's effort to look at high-speed rail. High-speed rail will go through, go through Central East Side. It cannot go on the surface. It's ludicrous. But uh, hopefully we will shed some light on what should happen. Um, thirdly, you know, it's been an industrial sanctuary, but I think that term 
is almost like a 19th century term. Yes. These are not uh, rendering plants. These are not hog farms. These aren't, these aren't foundries. Uh, I would love, for example, to live next to Wink's hardware. That, that to me would be, that's, that's ground zero for me. But that's, you know, that's an industrial use. Uh, Central East Side has no height limit. People don't know that. You could build a thousand foot tower in Central East Side. Uh, housing is precluded, uh, except in a narrow area. We, even though we built a streetcar line on it. Um, having said that, I think there's been some recent progress made on the intersection of I-84 and I-5 as part of the city's planning process, which I think is really important. Right. But, um, you know, I, I, I'll recall a, 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 an important moment. I chaired PDC. We had just bought all the land at the Burnside Bridgehead, almost two acres, vacant land next to the Burnside Bridgehead. So we called together all the powers that be in the Central East Side and said, it's a blank slate. What should happen with this property? And they said, well, let's see. It's not good housing. It's, it's office space wouldn't work. And it's not really good industrial use. We don't really know. And if I'd had my wits about me, and I, and I, know, I knew then what I know now, we would have said, we're not devoting staff resources to Central East Side because there's no appetite for change here. There's no, there's no vetting by planning of what should happen. Uh, Bear in mind that in an urban renewal area, when PDC staffers attend a meeting, their salaries eat into inexorably the increment that's available to be spent. And these are not free people. So yeah. uh, they need to be a SWAT team rather than babysitters. You did say something to me this morning that I, I thought was well put, that, uh, uh, that the Central East Side has the opportunity to become Portland's Brooklyn. Yeah, I love it. My Mary has two nephews that, that work in, that live in Brooklyn. And uh, I think it's the, really the prototype of what, what America could look like. It's a crazy quilt pattern. You know, the old zoning used to be to separate uses. Uh, it's just all kinds of different uses that seem to bounce off of each other and, and give a vitality. And I, and I see that potential in, in the Central East Side but the zoning and the planning don't reflect that yet. I think there's hope that that'll happen. Yeah, I think of Brooklyn in the context of my own experience. I attended New York University in, in Manhattan, and in those days, in the early 90s, there was, there was never any reason to go to Brooklyn. The only person I really knew in Brooklyn in a certain respect was Mr. Cotter from Welcome Back Cotter. Um, <laughs> And now everyone I went to college with who is still in the city lives in Brooklyn. And uh, it's, it, it gives me pause thinking about uh, um, some of the neighborhoods we have in the city that have a lot of vitality today and imagining that, that the Central East Side could be, you know, really a place where uh, maybe still industrial stuff happens, but is also a place where you live, work, and play. Exactly, yeah. It's never going to be true, Brooklyn, because one of Mary's nephews lives in an area where you need to speak Portuguese to, to survive well. <laughs> um, thinking about some of the other districts in town and, and uh, the opportunity and challenges that exist there, uh, um, you've talked also in the past about uh, the lack of cohesive visions for some of the urban renewal areas that exist in the city, particularly places like Lentz and Gateway, and maybe the idea that they, that they need attention but aren't quite ready for prime time. Well, I, I believe that in both of those areas, which are very, very important, that the council, in effect, said to PDC, these areas are blighted, go fix them. And two things should have happened. One, PDC, and I was chair of it, should have said, we're not gonna take it on because there's no appetite for change in those areas. They don't really want change. And two, the planning commission hasn't promoted that change, hasn't, uh, hasn't vetted it, and hasn't decided what projects we should be working on. And, uh, you know, that was 10 years ago, and there's really nothing that's happened, um, despite the fact that I think both areas have enormous potential. But you can't, re the city can't force a neighborhood to change. And PDC, even if that, even if the city tried to do that, PDC is not the body to do it. Planning is the body to do it. And I think we'll talk about this later, 
but the boundaries between planning and development have been blurred so badly uh, to that I think both agencies have suffered. Right, right. Uh, uh, another uh, uh, area of town that I think is worth discussing, although I should also confess that I'm not impartial about, is uh, the Rose Quarter or, or the Rose Quarter and Memorial Coliseum. It seems like there's a lot happening now, but uh, we got started on this road because uh, there was an effort to build a minor league baseball stadium there, and that isn't normally the type of impetus that exists for, for good planning, but at the same time, uh, just as we talked about the potential that exists in the central east side, um, maybe e that could be even more said of, of the Rose Quarter in that you have uh, the city's major east side transit node there, you have a new streetcar line going along the northern edge of the property, and so um, you know whether one believes in, in saving Memorial Coliseum or not, um, one way or the other, that district is going to be very, very important. Yeah, it's been hampered, as I understand it, by an agreement with the Blazers. They had say, they had control of that area, so you had to convince the owner to that uh, <laughs> the owner of the property to promote a change. But um, it's another area that really uh, could be important. I think most people believe, for example, that true high-speed rail wouldn't come to Union Station. You're not going to cross the Willamette twice. You're not going to put high-speed rail across the steel bridge. Most people believe that a true high-speed rail station would, in fact, be roughly where the, the uh, silo is, where the Dreyfus silo is, yeah. probably underground. But it's so important to plan that so that uh, investments like was just announced yesterday, the Dreyfus is putting $20 million into that silo uh, so that investments aren't made that preclude things happening. Right. But I, you know, I, I'm encouraged because I understand uh, that there's some potential for the city-owned, PDC-owned property around the Coliseum to be housing uh, so that you could have a neighborhood that where there's vitality other than the times when there's a Blazer or Winter Hawks game. Absolutely, and that's another uh, district that is that is just too single, too much single use, and yet you, you, you've spent most of your career as a private developer, and one of the things I enjoy about talking with developers, kind of like a lot of city leaders, is that you're in the business of having a vision, and um, when one stands at the Rose Quarter, the, you can just see so much potential there. You, you look at the riverside and see a parking lot for Rose Garden employees uh, where there could be an extension of the East Bank Esplanade. Um, you see, um, you know, in the case of Memorial Coliseum, a building that, ha that is truly one of a kind in the world, but that which makes it one of a kind is something that almost no one has experienced. The fact that it's the only arena pretty much in the world with a 360 degree view through the glass to the outside and yet no one's ever experienced that. And, and you look at the, the parking garages and the surface parking lots and, and think this just isn't the Portland that I know and, and yet there's so much potential to make this a kind of second downtown. Well the one common thread in people in my business which is the owners of office buildings is that we're impatient. If we're not impatient we don't survive because we pay mortgages by the minute. And so the fact that the Memorial Coliseum is set vacant for how many years, Brian? Virtually vacant. Virtually vacant, uh, 20 plus. But uh, at the same time, there is potential in the, the two arena combination of the Rose Quarter and the Coliseum that hasn't been taken advantage of, maybe because of some of the ownership issues you've talked about. Um, uh, uh, every other city in the United States has, uh, when they build a new NBA arena, for example, they've understandably torn down the old one. But now we've found that there is uh, uh, a business to be had in Portland precisely because of the two arena configuration that, for example, the Do Sports Action Tour uh, comes here for that two arena configuration. So there is a lot of potential there that just isn't being taken advantage of. You know, the Memorial Coliseum actually um, is a lot busier than some people think. There was one year that it actually had more events than the Rose Quarter did, but they tend to be smaller events. And so um, it's 6,000 people instead of 20. And so no one's ever stopped to think about uh, what the business model is for that two arena configuration. Um, there's a lot of piecemeal attention or there's uh, you know, mayoral stakeholder committees made up of partial voices and, and uh, uh, it just seems like year after year we, we try and make something happen and just fall a little bit short. Um, 
one other issue I wanted to ask you about, though, on our list is uh, West Hayden Island. That's another one that's been in the news a lot lately, and um, uh, the mayor was really making an effort to, to wrap this up before his administration ended, and unfortunately the clock ran out, but it does seem like there's still a lot of effort to get resolution there, whether one believes in creating a deep water port or in um, preserving wildlife sanctuary. Yeah, I'm optimistic that that's going to get resolved soon, and I, and I think a, all the people involved, including Mayor, Mayor Adams, who's made that a priority, I think deserve a lot of credit, absolutely. Right. right. Um, I'd like to ask you about another area of town that I think is is particularly near and dear to your heart because of some of the historic buildings there, the, the Skidmore Old Town Historic District. Now, uh, we can really look to some genuine and substantial um, progress that's been made in a certain respect in in Skidmore and Old Town that we have things like the classical Chinese garden, uh, we have the presence of the University of Oregon there now, putting people on the street, but um, I don't know if I would say that it's a great neighborhood yet or that it's a, a, a well-functioning neighborhood. No, it can't. Uh, the city long ago declared asphalt lots to be a blighted use and they just kill a neighborhood. Uh, there's hardly anything worse than just than an asphalt parking lot. The assumption when, when well, they were declared a blighted use, but the existing lots were grandfathered, the assumption back then was that the pace of development would eliminate them. They, the problem would just go away. Well, the pace of development hasn't uh, maintained that, it hasn't maintained that pace. And the Skidmore District in particular, this is the area south of Burnside, is almost half asphalt lots and uh, it has no future until and unless that issue is decided. Lots of ideas about how to do it. Unfortunately, those ideas came up in a stakeholder group where the, nothing was allowed out of that group that wasn't held unanimously. So maybe more about that later. And surface parking lots are, are, in a certain respect, a big part of your own story in that uh, uh, you uh, s had a lot of success or made a lot of progress uh, uh, restoring some of the great old cast iron buildings on the waterfront and nearby. And uh, uh, unfortunately, a good half of them were, were uh, destroyed in the middle part of the 20th century precisely uh, for the purpose of building surface parking lots. Yeah, well-meaning people. They, they they thought they were doing the right thing for the central city. <laughs> Every generation seems to think, you know, we're, we're the ones that have figured it out and learned all these lessons, but then there no, are... We're right, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, another uh, project I'd like to talk about, but one that does seem like, hopefully, you know, knock wood, there's a little bit of positive progress on is uh, Centennial Mills. Uh, uh, we have these, these great old mills along the waterfront, not too far from where a lot of development has happened in the Pearl District, but uh, they've sat more bound for quite a long time and are maybe a little bit of an island still. And, uh, um, you know, should we fish or cut bait on, on Centennial Mill? Well, I think we are fishing and cutting bait on Centennial, Centennial Mills, as I understand it. Uh, I think it's, that, that project has needed a champion and I think in the case of Harsh, that's, that's happened. So I'm very optimistic about it. Mm -hmm. I've always wondered if uh, part of the success or failure of the Centennial Mills might also relate to, uh, at least in, in the future, the, the removal of the Portland Police Bureau's horse paddock there, that, that there would be a lot of, of land to help integrate the Centennial Mills into the, into the urban fabric better if, if there were people and not horses there. You know, I, absolutely, and I think it, uh, equally important, the, the Greenway can't be allowed to stop there. The Greenway needs to continue through Centennial Mills. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that that's part of the program, though. Right, right. Um, we were talking about parking earlier, and um, uh, that has uh, reared its head in another way, in another kind of issue du jour that is being bandied about in the city, this idea of some of the uh, apartment buildings and, and high-density housing that we're building in, in some of the city's historic neighborhoods that in some cases are being built with little or no parking, and that's causing problems for some of the residents of the neighborhoods there. But at the same time, you know, after we've spent three years wondering when development is going to come back, you know, do we really want to hinder the development that is coming back? Well, I think, it, I think that issue is getting resolved uh, in, in probably with some sort of a permit parking. So I, th I think that may well be almost behind us. 
keep my fingers crossed. Right. Well, so much of what we're talking about is that kind of vital center where uh, the solution isn't uh, X or Y, but some something in between that, uh, uh, you know, we seem to need some kind of middle ground on on apartment buildings and parking in these historic neighborhoods that that um, stop short of, of you know, outlying good developments, but um, maybe addresses projects that um, pass a kind of tipping point for density in the neighborhood. Um, maybe finally, uh, before you, you have some particular remedies that, that we're going to discuss about uh, going forward, but uh, I wanted to also ask about another project that seems to embody a lot of potential, which is the relocation of the post office downtown. Uh, uh, it's right on the border between uh, the Skidmore, Old, uh, between Old Town and the Pearl District, and um, you know it represents a large swatch of land, um, and yet um, we seem to be, you know, as a city, kind of dragging our feet on this. Yeah, I, I can't really comment about it. Clearly, it's an important site. A lot of people would like to see that developed. And I think the post office would like to relocate uh, closer to the airport. So I think, I think the ingredients are in place for that to happen. And I, ju I, I just don't know the progress. It strikes me uh, when I think about a project like the post office, um, uh, this is the case with Central East Side as well. I think of some of these major um, streets and avenues that we have in the city and that, that ought to kind of have an identity as, as great streets and boulevards. And, and uh, Broadway is one of those. Uh, north of uh, Burnside, it seems like it wants to be um, this border, this kind of permeable border between Old Town and the Pearl with a lot of street activity and traffic and a lot of vitality to it and and we've done a great job of introducing some individual projects like the Museum of Contemporary Craft or or uh, bringing Max through there but it but it's still kind of like we were saying about certain other parts of town don't it just doesn't quite feel like we uh, have reached the the destination we're looking for no but and, and I'm eager to get on to the, the remedies but I think the Pearl District is the prototype of how an urban renewal area should happen uh, the Pearl District, the, the, the folks that owned the property in the Pearl District came to the city with my friend Greg Baldwin as their spokesperson and said to the city, we'd like it to be an urban renewal area. This is what we'd like it to look like. This is what we're prepared to do. This is what we would like the city to do. This is where we'd like the parks. This is where we'd like the streetcar. Um, and it was just this, this uh, if, if uh, the ter term of like the grand bargain, but it came to the city on a silver platter. And uh, so the planning was done, the vetting was done, and PDC, in a sense, had an easy job. They didn't have to, the, the vetting was done. They just had to deliver on those promises. And it happened in, 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 in just at this lightning speed by comparison to, say, Lentz and Gateway that are even older but uh, not successful because they weren't vetted. That might be a good segue to um, uh, talking about the remedies that, that you're proposing. And uh, first among those is, is the, the unique and powerful role of the Portland Planning Commission. And, and um, you know, it occurred to me when you and I started talking about this conversation that uh, even for me writing about uh, development and design in Portland over the last decade and a half, um, I, I feel like the Planning Commission is something that you speak of in golden terms, but but I haven't really thought of as being uh, a major player in the city, maybe not as much as it should be. Well, they haven't been asked to be a major player, um, but I'm optimistic. I mean, the, the Planning Commission ideally is a diverse group of people with a common thread. They're all opinion leaders, and I don't know them all, but I know four of them, Andre Ba, the chair, uh, Howard Shapiro, Mike Houck, uh, Chris Smith, I mean, they fit that bill, they're opinion leaders. Um, so the commission itself, uh, we couldn't ask for a better one, but they need to be tasked with important issues, and they, and they haven't been. But I, uh, the planning commission is unique, and they, fer they, they fulfill a role that the, the council simply can't, because council perhaps unfairly, they run for election, they accept campaign contributions, and they're just inevitably tainted by that. Planning Commission is pure. They're volunteers, they're opinion leaders, but you're being judged by your peers. And there have been very few uh, mayors who've really used the Planning Commission 
uh, in the right way, and uh, it just it just it just begs to happen. It's it's a magical, pure body. You've also talked uh, here in, in in our prior conversations about the boundaries between planning and development and the importance of that. Yeah, um, planning needs to accept the responsibility to make decisions about what should happen. And then PDC needs to make it happen. That's, that's the way uh, PDC was created. But PDC, well, I think planning has abrogated its, its responsibilities and PDC has waded in to fill the void. And I think both agencies have, have suffered as a result of that. Absolutely. Uh, you also have uh, discussed the structure of how we make a lot of decisions, uh, particularly the, the growing influence that seems to have uh, been exhibited on stakeholder groups. Yeah, if I never see another one, I'll be thrilled. Um, <laughs> particularly the stakeholder groups that are now fashionable where nothing comes out that's not unanimous. And if you think about it, it's a politician's dream because they filter out controversy. Nothing comes to an elected official out of a, such a body that has any controversy attached to it. But um, I can cite several examples. An old one, um, years ago I was on a stakeholder group that Fred Hansen put together dealing with, with uh, air pollution in the, in the uh, Portland area. And the auto dealers, the auto manufacturers, the fuel distributors, the, the refiners were all present. We couldn't deal with the automobile. This is honest to God truth. We concluded that we should regulate lawnmowers because the lawnmower people weren't there, if, if they had been. But, you know, in the, in, in, in the Skidmore district, uh, parking is, is the issue. Parking lot owners vetoed any of the creative ideas like taxing the income from the parking lots, for example. You could do that. You could end the grandfathering. You could construct new, new structured parkings so, so that you take that demand away. And, uh, but with a stakeholder group, that, that isn't permitted. And even, you know, Governor Kitzhaber convened this fabulous group chaired by Paul DeMunis to look at, at, at corrections policy. They met for two years, a year, I guess. The, the, the whole purpose of it was to make recommendations to the legislature. And a month ago, they concluded without taking a vote. No recommendations. Why? Because it would have been a split vote. We need to, we need to eliminate the fashion of a stakeholder group. And I think of the stakeholder group that the mayor convened to look at Memorial Coliseum in the Rose Quarter. And uh, I remember before the stakeholder group convened, uh, some of us in the group that were trying to save the Coliseum were, felt like we were shouting from the rooftops, this is a, a multi-purpose arena and multi-purpose is gonna trump any single use. What we need to do is engage in the deferred maintenance that we should have already done and were contractually obligated to do. And so the stakeholder group suggested ideas like a water park um, and, and all these other idea, individual ideas. Um, and the, the stakeholder group seemed to consist of everyone under the sun except for experts. Well, in the stake, you know, I, I, I don't own property in Central East Side, but I'm a stakeholder. I consider myself a stakeholder. I don't own property on the West End, uh, you know, West Hayden Island, but I consider myself a stakeholder. The definition of what, what constitutes a stakeholder needs to include all members who have, a, you know, an indirect stake in what happens. But too, too often they're just narrow, narrowly defined as property owners or, or uh, special interests. That's just not the case. We're gonna, in a second here, open this up to audience questions, but maybe uh, as my kind of final basic question to you, uh, uh, we've talked about problems and prescriptions and so forth, um, but uh, you know, you're someone who strikes me uh, as a passionate individual about Portland, and, and so I'd love to hear you know, what, what are you optimistic about and, and what are we doing right? Well, you can't be in my business without being an optimist. But if you look at, at the potential, uh, we have the Conway project. Uh, we have the, the potential for something dramatic to happen in the Zaydel property. The North Reach uh, begs to happen. Uh, the post office site. So th it isn't that there aren't opportunities. And it isn't that we don't have a fabulous planning commission. I'm crazy about Susan Anderson and Joe Zender, the, the, the heads of the planning commission. I like uh, 
that uh, Patrick Quinton and uh, uh, Scott Andrews, the heads of PDC, the personnel are right. We elected a pragmatic mayor ahead of a progressive candidate. Uh, Steve Novick is on the council with beholden to no one. <laughs> My, that's a good thing, isn't it? I just, I just think this, again, the stars may be aligned, the people are in place, and I think we can do great things. Kind of a kumbaya moment, you could say. <laughs> <laughs> Guilty as charged. <laughs> so with you. that, maybe we'll open it up to audience questions. Thank you very much for that kumbaya moment. Uh, and now if you have a written question on an index card, please hold it up high so that the City Club staff can collect it from you. Thank you very much. The first question for our speaker, as always, will be from today's Friday Forum host, Bill Holmer. Bill is the president of First Princeton Corporation. He joined City Club in 1999 and currently serves as the club's treasurer and chair of the Finance Committee. Bill? Bill refused to tell us what the question is going to be, so. <laughs> and John did ask. So. <laughs> Uh, thank you, John. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh, the role of urban renewal districts in the development of the Pearl District and a couple of others that have not been as successful. Uh, critics uh, contend that the urban renewal districts divert tax dollars that could go to support schools and provide basic services. Uh, when will we be at a point or are we at a point where we should have a moratorium on new urban renewal districts? Well, I mean, ideally we, have, we never have that moratorium, but they need to perform the way they were intended. If you, if you look at the South Auditorium area, you know, the very first urban renewal area, that was a fantastic investment that has returned uh, untold riches to the city. But it's like a savings plan. You, you, you save money, you invest it, and you get a return from it. Uh, you can't make that case in many of the more recent urban renewal areas, but it's not the fault of the concept. So I hope we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I think we've talked about why the more recent urban renewal areas have failed, but it's not the it's not the it's not the fault of the it's the fault of the players, not not the not the not the system. We'll now take questions from the floor. As always, we invite members to the microphone to ask their question. Asking questions at the Friday Forum is a privilege of City Club membership, and membership is open to everyone. Before asking your question, please identify yourself as a City Club member and ask your question as directly as possible. If I flash this question mark, it means please wrap up your question. Thank you. Tom Markgraf, City Club member. John, thanks for the uh, reference to Neil Goldschmidt and what he did in creating a, a solvent downtown. A lot of people believe that that happened because he forced an increase in transit overnight of 40% with buses, and then he insisted on, on having light rail and began the light rail process. That whole excitement has been diminishing since his era. What is the future of transit in vitalizing and keeping downtown and the region um, prosperous? Well, transit, in, in Neil's belief, and it's been proven correct, transit done correctly is an economic development tool. Uh, the amount of development that's occurred on the light rail lines and the streetcar lines is enormous, and the payback is enormous. Um, and Neil, Neil had a, an understanding about that. Uh, so that, that's the future of, of transit is a recognition I think that it's an economic development tool. Chris Smith, club member. Um, John, you were kind enough to name me as an opinion leader. I think uh, most people here would know that uh, one of the primary issues that I try and be an opinion leader about is uh, having Portland be less reliant on the automobile. And I can envision you know, a more prosperous, more sustainable, more livable Portland as a result of that. Um, I am often discouraged by institutional resistance to changes that to me are, are obviously beneficial. Uh, clearly there's room for debate, but um, it seems to me that in some ways there are 
deep institutional forces that argue for the status quo and that that would impact a lot of the things that you have um, talked about today. Um, you know, in my issue, I'll, I'll name some names in your spirit of candor today. Uh, the Oregon Editorial Board, uh, the Portland Business Alliance around issues like protected cycle tracks downtown. Uh, how do we, it, part of forcing change is not just political leadership, it's also the institutions in town and how do we bring everybody together to get a change agenda? Well, I can tell you two stories, Chris, that uh, really changed the equation. You know, I served for eight years on the state's transportation commission, and my fellow commissioners railed against the expenses for bike lanes until they met my wife, who commutes to work by bike uh, over Hill and Dale. And I, you know, I've talked long about the fact that I'm when she takes her bike to our kids and goes up North Williams in a protected bike lane. Bike lane I mean, that matters to me. When they met Mary, they changed their, their conviction entirely. Honest to God, it, all of a sudden it wasn't these 20-year-old bike messengers, it was you know, one of us. The second story, which is even more chilling, um, is at a PBA retreat, I'll not name names, somebody got up and said, I understand why Amsterdam has such great bike participation, it's because of the lower standard of living. Present in the room was Vim Vivelle. <laughs> I mean, he rested his case. Uh, Kurt, Kurt Webring, member. Um, with all this list of projects, I didn't hear you talk about the most expensive proposed project in the region, $4.3 billion for the Columbia River crossing which we find uh, political leaders in southern Washington are having more and more resistance to um, light rail. And many people say, uh, apparently in southern Washington, that if you do tolling, they'll go and take the 205 uh, crossing so that they can then uh, jam up 84 and also just have this nice uh, congestion where I-5 and 84 meet. So my question is, <laughs> kind of a loaded question, what's your view of the CRC? Well, I'm reminded of, uh, you know, the kook and the sandwich board that, has, that says the end of the world is tomorrow. At some point, he's going to be right, right? I think people have, people have been saying it's too late to start over, and at some point, they're going to be right. And maybe that point is now. Um, it's much too long a topic, but the um, ODOT is not very good at public approval. TriMet is a master, but TriMet views the participants as cooks in the kitchen. ODOT re it views public participation as restaurant reviewers. You never actually invited into the kitchen, and had 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 people at Metro and PBOT, very, very, very talented people, been involved in PDOT in the Columbia River Crossing from the beginning, it would have been a better project and probably would have been built. But it may be too late to start over. I'd like to add one thing to that if I could. Uh, I have a question for people. Uh, I'd like to address the Columbia Crossing issue by imagining downtown Portland, if there were one bridge going over the Willamette, um, on Interstate 5, be it the Markham Bridge or the Fremont Bridge. So if we had one bridge going over the Willamette, um, would we tear that bridge down and rebuild it, or would we build the Hawthorne Bridge or the, Mark, or, or the Morrison Bridge? Um, I, I've been disappointed that a very sensible seeming alternative, building a local bridge to Vancouver, which would alleviate a lot of traffic on the Interstate Bridge, uh, has not really ever been, ever been uh, given the light of day, and wondered if you think that is a solution that could still be possible. Well, I, I think we may have arrived at the point where it's too late to, to start over. I regret to say that, but I think that's the case. Hi, Rick Jacobs with KGW member. John, rarely do all politicians agree. They do on one issue, jobs. We've got to move the needle and create jobs, attract businesses. What can the Planning Commission and the process do to help us move that needle? Well, I hope, I hope that we've been trying to address that all along. I mean, the Planning Commission, the Planning Bureau, and PDC can, to quote a phrase, just do it. Get on with it. 
uh, and get, get some of that natural uh, impatience that I think is important. Let me ask a question, if I may, from the, from the, oh, go ahead, John. Well, I think uh, we have all kinds of, uh, I think you can make the metaphor, you can invent the greatest hammer in the world, but if it ever touches a nail, does it really do any good? John, let me ask a question that came from uh, one of the index cards in the community today. Not all Portlanders would agree that the changes, particularly in North Northeast Portland, are a success. How should the city balance development with the wants and needs of existing communities and property owners, and how do you feel about so-called gentrification? Well, it's an issue that we dealt with uh, when I chaired PDC, and it was a very interesting, Mary and I went to the opening of a movie that was done locally, the premiere of it, and the people set out to show the damaging effects of gentrification. And it was fascinating to see their opinion change over the time that they did the movie because they chose to use as the person, the property owner, and most importantly, uh, to use as an example, she lived next to a meth house. She had a child. She wanted gentrification. She wanted the elimination of that meth house. And the conclusion that the movie makers came to, which is what I think we need, to, the conclusion we need to come to, is that displacement is the problem. Gen if, if you own property, gentrification is good. If you rent property, it's not so good. And uh, PDC had lots of tools to, 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 to promote home ownership, but they were available on the net, for example. <laughs> and the people who really needed that sort of help probably weren't surfing the net every night. And what we finally concluded is that you had to bang on the doors at dinner time uh, in order to make that change. Um, Barbara Dudley, City Club member. Um, I, I think the answer to my question is a continuation of what you were just saying. But you earlier referred to the difference between a good and a bad urban renewal project as one of the players and how they were executed. And I just wanted you to elaborate more on that. Well, um, ideally, before an area is declared an urban renew renewal area, the planning needs to, uh, A, establish the fact that there's uh, an appetite for change and needs to identify the places where that, needs, that, that change needs to take place. Only then, should it be declared an urban renewal area. If it's done that way, then the investments are made quickly, the return is, is returned quickly, and uh, it's a good investment of time and energy. Sharon Robbins, City Club member. You talked about how things worked well in the Pearl and they haven't worked so well in Lanson Gateway. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about Linton, um, because We've watched everything kind of come together slowly, but across the river on the other side, on the St. John side of the St. John's Bridge. But um, I drive through Linton every day, and I, I don't see anything happening. I, I don't know the answer, Sharon. I, I know that when I served on the Transportation Commission, uh, there was a death of a child coming home from school, tried to cross, cross the highway and was killed. And, um, and the community asked ODOT to decrease the speed limit. And I, <clears throat> I lobbied for that and, and lost. And I remember when um, the Planning Bureau launched the River Renaissance thing, which was a total waste of time. Um, it, and actually the River Renaissance proved conclusively that the Willamette was a terrific place for salmon, industry, housing, you know. And, but didn't deal with the Linton community's request that a, the, the vacant paper mill site become a place for housing. So the, Linton is a place that the city has forgotten, um, I, I'm afraid. I don't, have a, I don't have a remedy for it. But I would like to say, going all the way east, uh, I would hope that in 10 years we can start paving streets that are unpaved, east of 82nd, 
I hope that we can see sidewalks provided for that area and that, and that the city would be, in a sense, more egalitarian. There wouldn't, that not, not that you'd make east of 82nd the pearl, but you would make it a, a much more friendly, uh, safe uh, neighborhood with, with the same kinds of improvements that we expect everywhere. I'm afraid that we've run out of time for further questions and we'll have to stop for the day. Please join us next week when Senator Ron Wyden talks to the City Club about advancing U.S. energy from an Oregon perspective. And as we close today, please join me in offering a sincere thanks to today's speakers, John Russell and Brian Libby. We're adjourned. <laughs>